Hey everybody, welcome back to Darby the Farmhouse. I'm Maddie, and if this is your first time being here, welcome. And if you've been here before, thanks for coming back and hanging out with us. So I had people on my Instagram tell me that they wanted to see me do my makeup while talking about plants and doing the plant profiles. So I have to get ready today. I don't know if I'm gonna keep this eye makeup on because I kind of wanted to do something a little bit different, but um, I'm gonna do it and then I may have to wipe it off and start over so that I can go somewhere and not have to look super dolled up, but we'll see. Um, if you like what you see here on my channel, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on when I upload. I talk about plant care, plant hauls. Um, I do the plant profile uh, videos during my makeup. So DIYs, all kinds of stuff. So if that's what you're into, let's hang out more, hit that subscribe button, and let's go ahead and get on into the video. So let's go ahead and talk about kind of where the Monstera comes from um, and what it's related to. So the Monstera mainly grows in like Central America. Um, you can find it on some other tropical islands such as in Hawaii. Um, it is part of the Aroid family which also contains like pothos and also philodendrons, any of those chunky root kind of plants that are also in the Arake family. I don't know really how to say that, but um, they're all kind of related, which is also kind of leads to some confusion when talking about the Monstera deliciosa because some people call it a philodendron, even though it's related, it is not a philodendron. Um, and in particular today, we're talking about the Monstera deliciosa. So like I said, the Monstera deliciosa mainly grows in Central America. It grows on the forest floors and it climbs up the trees trying to reach the light at the top of the canopy. So these really trendy plants actually also produce fruit. So when we look at the name Monstera deliciosa, it means delicious monster because it, I mean, it gets monstrous leaves that are, can be like three feet across and it also produces fruit that you can eat. So when I was researching, you can eat these fruit um, as long as they're cooked. If they're not cooked, they can cause like throat irritation, but they taste like a mix of pineapple and banana. So, um, but it when we have them in captivity, they don't produce like the fruit very often so it's not something you really see when we have them in our homes but in nature they definitely do produce it's almost like fruit kind of like corn on the cob or it kind of reminds me a little bit of like pomegranate seeds how they have like it comes in like it looks like corn on the cob and then they fall out um and then I assume that the seeds are inside and then you like cook the flesh off the seeds uh, so you can, I know you can find more on the online, but that's what I found. These plants, like a lot of other plants, can be variegated, which are also very popular right now. Um, they, the variegated versions can be super expensive, and a lot of them, even though they do produce, like, sport variegation or, like, natural variegation, because of their popularity, they've become, like, more increasingly, um, like, purposely mutated to produce the variegation so that people can cultivate them at like higher rates. So, but that is for another day. Let's continue talking about Monstera deliciosa, the non-variegated. Um, so uh, these plants, even though they seem like they've become really trendy recently, they actually kind of started becoming trendy in like the 1970s, which we'll get more into. Um, but I know they're super trendy right now and a lot of people use them to decorate their homes to kind of create like a structurally appealing um, plant in the space because monsteras do grow on vines. They grow really big and they produce these really large um, fenestrated leaves that are definitely like talking pieces when they get larger. Like somebody comes to your house, like it's a conversation starter for sure. And they're just very unique in the way that they grow. So um, I know a lot of, they've become really popular and they became really popular in homes because they did create that like jungle aspect and because of their growing structure. 
some cultures, like the Chinese culture, um, from what I found, monsters can represent longe long longevity. Oh my gosh, why can I not say that? Longevity? Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but also, it can represent respected people and honored elders. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, going on into the way they grow in the wild and also in our homes. So if you've ever seen a larger monstera, whether it's like in somebody else's house or in the wild, or maybe you have one of your own, you'll notice that like they produce aerial roots that kind of like grow off of the plant and hang. Um, so in the wild, as monsteras are growing from the forest floor, these aerial roots can help them to climb to the top of the canopy. And it helps them to like stabilize themselves. So a lot of times people will put monsteras on moss poles so that they can attach the moss pole and climb like they would in the wild. So these aerial roots sometimes don't even attach to anything. If they don't have anything to attach to, they kind of just hang off. Um, and you'll see like some people cut them off. Some people put them in water because then it allows the plant to intake um, extra nutrients. Although some people say that's not good for them because it can cause that aerial root to like become diseased and root or rot and kill it back. So, I mean, that's kind of your own decision, but um, that's what a lot of people do with them. Um, mine is producing aerial roots, but they're growing into the dirt, so I'm just letting them do their thing. Um, in the wild also, as they're growing on the forest floor, like if you have a baby monstera, you'll notice that they will produce like baby leaves that are like these solid, they don't have any fenestrations or like the holes in them. They are solid and they're heart shaped and they're really pillowy. And that's how they start on the forest floor. And then as they continue to grow and get closer to light, they then create the fenestrations, the holes, the things that cause us to call them the Swiss cheese plant also. Um, and those fenestrations allow the plant to take in sunlight to the base of the plant and for it to go through leaves. It also allows for the water to go through the leaves to the base of the plant and then the plant absorbs the water that's come through. So that was something kind of cool that I found. Um, I know inside when you have your Monstera indoors and it's not really producing fenestrations, you can put it in more light and it will encourage it to create more fenestrations. So that's just something to think about if you're wanting your plant to start producing those. Put it where it's receiving just a little more light and it will most likely start to become more fenestrated. I forgot to add also that aerial roots help it, they help the plant with stability, but it also helps the plant to withstand strong winds and also the fenestrations allow it to withstand strong winds because the wind blows through the holes in the leaves. Okay, so let's get into like more of like the actual history part. So I couldn't find a whole lot on this. I think like it's hard to find some history on some plants if they're, they haven't had like hybrids made or like genetic mutations made or anything like that. Um, and I, I mean like if I dove deeper, maybe I could find a little bit more, but this is what I found. So Monsteras were discovered and like I saw like a few different things. So I saw some in the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s, but definitely in some time period in there, uh, they were discovered. I could not find by who, so I don't know like who exactly discovered it, but they discovered it and then they started to cultivate them for ornamental purposes. So like putting them in people's yards, putting them in people's houses, and they also cultivated them for the fruit. So they kind of started to gain more popularity um, in like the 1970s because of a French artist called Henry Matisse. Um, he had a huge monstera and he had some very, he painted them and he had a few pictures that kind of like went, um, or became really popular. And, and so after he kind of gained this month, these monsteras popularity, they kind of were like they are now very trendy in everybody's houses. Um, and that was just mainly because of him, from what I found. So, um, I'll try to put some of his pictures in here, but you can definitely look up Henry Matisse 
and Monstera, and you'll see there's, like, a picture of this huge Monstera that he has in his, like, living room or somewhere in his house. And then you can also find the other black and white photo of him sitting in front of his Monstera with his dog, I believe. Um, but that's pretty much all I could find as far as, like, that kind of history. So let's go ahead and get into care. I just realized I haven't, I better get working on my eyeshadow because I'm not going to finish in time to show you guys, like, the end. So... Okay, um, so when we're talking about care, I'm going to start with light because the first thing we do when we bring a plant home is we want to place it somewhere where it's going to be super happy and thrive and have the right light requirements. And so when we're talking about light for the Monstera, right, we know that they grow on the forest floor. We know that they grow towards the light. Um, so uh, this makes them pretty versatile. They will grow in low light and, but the only thing is if they're in low light, they're not going to grow as fast, um, or as well as if they're in bright and direct. So if they're, you, you could put them in like an office building or in a room that has like indirect or low light. But like I said, just keep in mind that your Monstera probably will not grow as well, will not grow as fast, and probably will not produce those really gorgeous fenestrations. I mean, eventually will, but um, if you're wanting them a lot sooner, you're gonna have to put it somewhere where it's gonna have a lot more light. Um, so when we're talking about like low light and indirect light, that's like a few hours of indirect sunlight from a window so like maybe kind of in the middle of a room or in a hallway where it gets only some sunlight um if we're talking about bright indirect that would be like a south facing window where it's getting light all day um I have mine in my laundry room where it gets like west sunlight and south sunlight but it's not getting direct sunlight because sometimes direct sunlight can scorch the leaves so um, you can also probably put it in like a west facing window and it'd be all right where it's getting um, like the morning sun. You could put it in a west facing window where it's getting the afternoon sun. I know some people, if they're in areas where they get enough humidity um, and it's not too cold, they will put their plants outside on their porches where they're getting like that indirect sunlight from the sides of the porch. So when you're bringing your monster home, just some things to think about. Um, you might also think about the temperature. So I know like when we're trying to put plants by like windows and stuff, um, we might have like a favorite window, but that window might not be the right temperature to support proper growth. So what I mean by that is Monsteras need like, like, like 60 to 70 to 5, 60 to 75 degrees to be really happy. Um, they are tropical plants, so they're not going to really like, you know, like cold breezes and anything less than those temperatures. Um, but I will also tell you that I have mine in my laundry room, like I said, and it's next to a window that gets pretty cold. Um, they're not sealed well, and my, that monster has been fine. So... I mean, if you're trying to place it, just think about those things, kind of think about the temperature, the light. Um, I think the only reason why it's okay being that close to those windows is because it does get like the, the west sunlight in the afternoons, which kind of warms everything up before the sun goes down. So, but you definitely don't want it to be super cold because it will freeze the leaves. Okay, so when we're talking about watering our Monsteras, um, you definitely don't want to overwater them because, like I said, they're aeroids. And aeroids have, like, super thick roots. And just kind of a general rule of thumb, most plants, if they have, like, those thick, juicy aeroid roots, they are going to be prone to root rot. And so you're not going to want to put them somewhere where or you're not gonna you're not gonna water them so much that they sit in water and those nice thick juicy roots start to rot um, because root rot is pretty hard to treat and get rid of 
so it's best to just prevent it. And best way to prevent it is by um, watering your Monstera when it is almost completely dried out. Um, sometimes, like my bigger one, it's hard because like it's in a bigger pot, so like it's not gonna dry out right away. Um, I probably could get away with like watering it like every few months or every like once a month. Um, but it, my smaller Monstera, like the one behind me, I, what did I just do? I definitely, um, will let that one dry out a lot more and I will let it dry out even to the point where the leaves will start to like curl or droop. So I don't think it's kind of doing that now, but, um, like that's the best telltale sign that your your monster is ready for water is if the leaves are kind of drooping or they're like kind of soft and curling and that's when I'll water. Um, as far as like tap water and like the difference between tap water and like filtered water, I don't think, I mean most plants don't like a buildup of minerals. So you're not going to want to like allow the water to build, like the minerals to build up in the soil and that's just something to like kind of watch if you have hard water. But um, I've watered my Monsteras with our, like, tap water, and they've been fine, so just kind of, like, watch your plant, see if how it's doing, and if it's seeming like it's declining, like, you probably need to water it with better quality water. While we're talking about watering, um, this is a good place to also add in that your Monstera will like high humidity. So you'll want to put it somewhere where it's going to be by like a humidifier or somewhere where there's a higher humidity content um, because if you don't, then your Monstera might start to get like crispy leaves. And I mean, it's although it's not really like, it's not really bad for your plant to get crispy leaves now and again. You, it's not something that's like super great. And so you... Like mine, I have mine in my laundry room, like I said, 3,065 times, but um, it it does well in there because like we have our laundry going, which is producing humidity. Also, like our bathroom is directly across the hall, so sometimes when we take showers, the humidity goes in there. Um, guys, my makeup is a mess. I don't know why it's like, you know why it's not doing well because I'm talking to you guys and I'm trying to actually like do a good job and so it's gonna be finicky anyway um, but you could just do like a like a little humidifier next to it and it'll do all right so um, let's move on to soil so like with most aeroids your monstera like i said if you're watering you don't want it to be sitting in water which means that as far as soil you want something that's going to drain pretty fast um so you can buy um like on etsy i know and on amazon the like monster like monster mixes that people have already made um which just are like chunky aeroid mixes that are already mixed you don't have to mix it yourself um but i also know some people just put them in regular potting mix and then just watch like how much it's drying out and how much they're watering it um you can also mix your own soil so you should do a mix of like bark because you could do a soilless mix which is like bark charcoal and pumice um, or perlite but um you can also add soil in there and do a mix of like the pumice perlite, or perlite, um, cocoa core, and um, also the bark and all that. I am not good at multitasking. I will tell you that right now. If you can't pick up that I'm not good at multitasking and talking and all that. Okay. So, um, that covers soil. We're almost done and I'm freaking out because I'm not done with this. Um, let's talk about fertilizing. So I fertilize my Monstera. If it's growing, actively growing and producing growth, I will fertilize it every other week. Um, but if it is 
not producing growth um, and it's kind of dormant, like some of them might be over the winter, um, I fertilize like every three weeks or like every like once a month. Um, or sometimes even if they're not growing, you can get away with not fertilizing them at all, especially if they're dormant because they're not like taking in nutrients from the soil and they're not needing the extra nutrients. Uh, so when we're talking about like fertilizer quality, I've fertilized mine, all of my plants with the same miracle Grow fertilizing mix for like ever because, um, a friend of mine gave us well, gave me, um, some, like, miracle Grow like, all-purpose fertilizer, and I just don't feel like being wasteful, so, um, and my plants have done fine, but if you are more, like, particular, a plant with a lot of foliage, like a Monstera, will do better with a 3-1-2 ratio, so it'd be three parts nitrogen, one part phosphorus, and then the two parts potassium. Um, so you can also, I know a lot of people, because like I can sometimes worry about like my dogs um, getting into the fertilizers and stuff, um, which can make them sick. So I know a lot of people use worm castings as like a slow release fertilizer. And then it's also like pet safe if they eat it, it's just worm poop. So, um, I feel like my dogs would be attracted to that and would bother my plants more. So I would not do that in my house, but if you don't worry about it, worm castings are the way to go probably. Um, I know you can also do like fish emulsion. Um, if you have like aquariums that you don't treat with like chemicals and stuff, you can use that. Oh, I just got that in my hair. Um, you can use that to fertilize your plants. Some people like mix um, like their scraps, like their eggshells and like peels and that kind of stuff. And then they blend it and fertilize and like mix it in their soils and fertilize their plants with that. So there's a lot of different ways you can use like synthetic fertilizers or you can use um, natural fertilizers if you're worried about that. Uh, so that's how I would fertilize my monster and that's kind of the requirements for monsters to have appropriate growth and to support the growth of those like huge beautiful leaves and if you want it to bloom um fertilizing sometimes will encourage that as well <sighs> i forgot concealer okay so i know i talked about like being able to eat the fruit off of these plants, but they are toxic, the rest of the plant is. So um, it is, and you know, the fruit can also be if it's not cooked. So if you have a monster and you have like children or animals that are gonna mess with it, um, I would just make sure that it's out of reach because if they eat the leaves or the stems or if for your plant, your monster is producing fruit if they eat any of that, um, your children or your animals, it can cause calcium oxalate crystals. I think I said that right. Um, and these crystals can like mimic like little teeny tiny microscopic needles. And when they are ingested, they can cause throat irritation. They can cause like kidney stones. They can cause, um, they can cause like severe pain. They can cause uh, like stomach irritation. It can cause like your pet or your child to um, throw up and have like intestinal distress. Um, so it's just best to make sure that it is in a safe place. If you have like critters or children that are gonna eat this plant, that they that you have it in a safe place where they can't get to it or they know like that it can like make them sick. We're almost done and I'm actually almost done with this. So let me powder my face really quick and I'll be back. Okay, so um, the best part of owning plants 
that you can propagate is obviously propagating them. So let's talk about how you can propagate monsteros. So um, I haven't propagated mine because like the one behind me is pretty little and I want my other one to get like really big before I cut it back. Um, but like any other plant, cutting it back will encourage more growth um, and like the vines and stems to produce below where you cut it. Um, and then you can also then take your cutting and propagate it and create a whole new plant. So uh, monsteras are pretty easy to propagate just like a lot of other aeroids. Um, you'll want to make sure that you have a clean pair of shears and you want to make sure that um, you have something to put your cutting in. So like I said, I haven't propagated mine um, just because I'm not ready, but you can most definitely cut below the node. So when I was talking about aerial roots earlier, you can locate the aerial roots or before they become like the long roots, um, they're just like little nodes along the vine. And then if you cut below them, you'll have a vine with a node at the bottom and in a vase of water, which um, actually looks pretty nice. If you put it like on a table or something, you can create like centerpieces or um, like decor with it until it produces roots and you're ready to move it to a pot. Um, you can also use moss. Um, I know like some people have used air la layering. So air layering is when you find like a node and you take moss or um, I think I, most people use moss. I've never tried it, but um, you wrap the moss around the node and then it, you like create the, or you, why am I having so many issues? You moisten the moss and then you wrap the moss in saran wrap or some kind of plastic to keep the moisture around that node. And then the node will produce roots in the moss and the damp moss. And then you can just cut it off and it's already got existing roots. Um, I have never tried that. I don't know how easy it is on monsteras, but I know that other people have done it. Um, if you were to cut, I guess it depends on how big of a cutting you take, but um, I would think moss would be kind of hard because like you need a lot of it to wrap around the root and to like get it growing. I don't know. I guess if it works for you, it works for you. Um, I prefer water just because it's easier to just fill like a vase with water and throw the cutting in there. Um, I know you could use LECA, um, which are like compressed like clay ball things that um, retain moisture. Um, you can also do pawn, which are like little um, porous rocks that people like to let their plants grow in. It's for like semi-hydro stuff, but you can also propagate in it. Um, you can also use like, did I say perlite? You can also use perlite. So there's a lot of different methods that people use to propagate by cutting with monsteras. Um, you can also propagate them by division. So if you, a lot of times your monsteras will produce more like baby monsteras from the root and you can very easily separate them out from the main plant and create a new plant. Um, and the nice thing about that is they've already got roots. So you can just separate it out. If it's got roots already, you can just plant it and you've got yourself a baby monster. And that's what I did with the one behind me. So if you follow me on Instagram, you've seen like the really big monster I have. Um, but the one behind me is a little baby off of the one in my laundry room. So that one's, that's a really easy method. Um, you can also grow them from seeds. So seeds are like a super easy way to propagate monsteras. You can get, um, like all the monsteras that I sell on our website, the, I have grown from seed pretty much. And you can get, I, I get mine from Plant Flix and I think there's like 15 seeds in a pack. Um, but I know you can also get, um, 
you can get them on Etsy and you can get a little bit, you could get more, you can get like a hundred or whatever, and they're not super expensive. So, um, that way is pretty easy too. I found that like the majority of the time they're fairly easy to sew. Um, I put them in like little seed greenhouses and then I will just, um, let them grow in there until they're ready to transfer to soil. So those are the ways to propagate monsteras. Oh my gosh, I can't think while I'm doing this. Um, kind of looks like a hot mess, but do I care? Not really. Uh, hold on. Just hold tight until I get this done because I can't think while I'm doing this. Okay, we're also on the last part of this video, which is pests. So, um, because of the viney nature of monsteras, it leaves a lot of room for pests that like stems, um, which would include like spider mites, uh, aphids, and then because of the size of the leaves, thrips. So if you have a monstera, um, you should be on the lookout for those three insects mainly. Um, if you are letting the soil dry out in between waterings, um, you probably won't have too big of an issue with, or, um, with fungus gnats, but that can happen. Um, so just keep an eye out for those things. One way to prevent any of those insects from bothering your monstera or your other plants is by taking some neem oil and occasionally wiping the leaves off with the neem oil. So the neem oil, when the insects eat it, will kill them. And then when you spray it on them, it kills them on contact. But it also makes the leaves like super shiny, the nice big leaves. And... Like I said, it'll prevent all of those pests from invading your monstera. So, that's all the care for monsteras, and I'm still not done, but I'm going to finish it so that you guys can at least see the final product. I do not have, I thought about getting lashes, but I don't have any right now, so my natural lashes are going to have to do. Okay, so... I'm just putting on my lipstick, but, um, I have to go to dinner later with my husband and his friends, but, like, they're older than us by, like, a lot, and I, I don't think they'd appreciate me coming over with bright green eyeshadow on and I feel like my husband would probably be a little bit embarrassed so I'm probably gonna have to wash it off but I do like how it turned out this is the final makeup look for today hopefully you guys enjoyed this style of video I know it was kind of a mess I promise I'll get better it's just hard to focus on both but I do like doing my makeup and talking to you guys and talking about plants. It's like having a little, a little chill sesh talking about stuff. So, um, that's it for today. Thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you for your support on my Instagram and other social media. If you are not following me yet, you can follow me on Instagram at mad, M -A -D -D dot, M -A -D -D dot plants. Or you can check out my shop page at diariesofafarmhouse.shop or our website www.diariesofafarmhouse.com. Uh, we do, well, I sell handmade pots, cement pots, um, custom pots, macrame hangers, hand-sewn bandanas, stickers, um, all kinds of stuff. So I'm also selling plants. So plants are now available online. I don't have heat packs right now. So we're me just make sure that you know the weather it's gonna have to travel through because a lot of tropical plants will not be able to travel below like 50 degrees so just keep that in mind if you order any plants from us um, but 
Thank you so much again for stopping by. If you don't want to miss out on anything for our business, you can definitely sign up for the newsletter. And then you'll also be able to know when we're having local community or we're going to local community markets in Colorado. Um, and also if you follow me on my other social media, you'll also get that information as well. Again, thank you so much. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and I'll see you guys again later. Bye.